everyone. Apologies if you were in my session. This is not going to be the original court recording because Screencast-O-Matic stopped working. So I'm going to try this again. Um, this is my webinar on how to get your language program organized and running. Um, it is an update to last year's session uh, because I want to add in some more information and of course we always learn something new as we're going. Uh, just to introduce myself, I am a 20 plus year teacher with the Atlantic Kent District School Board. I'm also the owner of Mrs. S Room on TPT and I love doing both of what I do. I spend a lot of nights obsessing over what I put on TPT and then a lot of days practicing it and learning new things and trying things out because we all know students are great educators and they will tell you very honestly whether you like it or not, whether something is no good. So just to go over what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about who I am a little bit more just so you kind of get some insight into my background. How do you schedule your literacy block? How do you get to all the strands? How do you read with everyone? How can you make kids more independent? What are some great sites to use and some common focus areas that you may want to look for when you're doing reading mini lessons and then building some time for some content subjects. Then how do you make more time for you? How do you pick perfect readouts for your grade? And I am a firm believer that although there is no perfect per grade, there's often a perfect for age range. So you shouldn't be reaching up to grade seven books if you're teaching grade four, because not only does that leave the grade seven teacher very little the content that is engaging for kids, and it's hard to find things in grade seven and eight. It also often the vocabulary, even though you're going to explain it, is at too high of a level. So students can understand two to three grades above where they currently are reading at. So we want to keep things within a very comfortable age range for our read alouds. That's my rant, sorry. Ted talk over. Who am I? So I have two beautiful girls, a wonderful husband. Three dogs, here is one little lady. She is a puppy and full of energy. So if you hear barking, apologies, it's probably her. The other two were fairly well trained. My weekly schedule. So my weekly schedule does not change. I could give this to a supply teacher and it would be the same schedule from October basically till May, June. Um, so on Monday, I read an article in small groups with students. I do suggest four to five students in a group. I find any more than that and it gets kind of unwieldy and I don't get to hear students read. I do assign each student a paragraph to read out loud. However, I spend the first couple weeks of school getting kind of an assessment done with students. I like the San Diego word list. I find it's quick and easy and I can find it on the internet. I know our school has gone to the BAS system and I've tried that. I also like that. So if your school uses that, you could use their word list as well to kind of get a feel for it. I do find San Diego maybe gives me even more detailed information um, and it does it very quickly. Uh, so for me, it's worth it for the San Diego word list. You have to use what your board tells you. You have to use what works for you. But I like San Diego. If my students are lower, so if they're still working in a primary level, I've also also used dual sight words um, because that gives me a sense of what digraphs they know, what consonant blends. Um, so what what do they know and what do they not know? What word families can they recognize? Um, this is the busiest day, Monday, because I'm reading with every group of students, or at least I try to. We all know that that doesn't always work. Um, so. I pull them very quickly and we go through the articles. And as I said, I will often give them, a, if, if I have students that's really gonna be uncomfortable reading, I will give them that paragraph. I might give it to them ahead, maybe even three days ahead. And I suggest that they read it to themselves first if they think they can, with a parent so that they're successful with them. And then even have Google Read and Write because I offer a digital version. So Google Read and Write can read it to you and then you can practice those words that you're not so sure of. So that when they finally come to the guided reading session, they've read this before. It's no big deal, not a, not a problem. If they are extremely below, and I have had those students, if they're extremely below, I might not put them in a group at the beginning of the year with everybody. But by extremely below, I mean like I taught six, seven and I had a student at a kindergarten level. When that was the case, I felt that they would be uncomfortable. Now, I did find that by mid-year, like by November, December, they were comfortable in a group with their friends where they listened and then parrot read back. 
I was okay with that. They could start to recognize a few root words. I wasn't focusing on whether they could read the entire article, but they might recognize the at. They might recognize the the. And so that was a great strategy for me. You really do have to do what works for you. But I do include all students in that guided reading if I can. And you'll see that the students for every day of the week have the exact same pretty much guided reading task. Assignment day one, assignment day two, assignment, assignment day three. I am a huge believer that students need to reread texts. And we often give them a text and then expect them to comprehend it and do everything they want with it in in a half an hour, but we haven't really taught the idea that you have to go back to that text multiple times. So I find if I give them an assignment every day for a week, they realize that, wow, I have to go back to the text this many times to find this many things. And they do have to go back because it's different days. It's not all done on the same day. So they know they haven't, it's not always fresh in their minds. They're going to have to reread. I do like that. The, the nice thing with this kind of schedule is that while Monday is jam packed, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are not so much. So I will check in with students on Tuesday. I pull any groups I didn't read with, although I try to get them all done. Uh, I pull groups to go over the assignment for Tuesday if I think it's needed. Often I make Tuesday fairly light because Monday is so heavy, because it's so busy, but not always. So I, I might need to pull them. On Wednesday, I might do a little midweek check-in with students. I might go over answers from the previous two days of assignments. I pull groups to go over the assignment for Tuesday if I think they need it. Um, and this is also where I'm really just checking in with kids. So I might also pull my weaker students to read with them multiple times so that I'm reading with those really weak students at least two to three times a week. And I can do that because the other students already have independent work to do and they know what they're supposed to do. And because the assignments don't change, well, not the assignments, sorry, the schedule doesn't change every week and they know exactly what they're supposed to do, it's not a big deal because I don't have to tell them every week what they're supposed to be doing. They already know. And by October, if you're running it this way, you'll find other students will turn to your weaker students and say, no, We've been doing this since September. You know you're supposed to be doing such and such. So it makes things easier for me. As far as a daily schedule, um, it's kind of set up into blocks of almost 20 minutes at a time. So silent reading is about 20 minutes. Spiral language, 10 to 15 minutes. Sometimes it's up to 20, depending on what they're doing. Um, I might throw in a writing mini lesson. Often this is done on a Thursday or a Friday when students are kind of completed assignments and I have a little more time. And then students are doing guided reading tasks. In it, I put 35 minutes, but sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's 35 minutes, sometimes it's 50 minutes. So their tasks can vary according to the day and they might take them longer on some days than on others. My only expectation is that they get them all done within a week. And I've run this different ways with different groups of students. I have run it as centers where we rotate every 20 minutes. Depending on your group, that might work. I've also run it, especially in grade seven and eight, where I give them kind of a checklist and say, you must get all these things done in a day. I don't care what order you get them done in. And I've also run it as, here's 20 minutes, you sit at your desk. Okay, 20 minutes is up, move on to your bell ringers. Okay, 20 minutes is up, move on to whatever writing task you're doing. So you have to set it up that it works for your students and that it works for your school and your school community. And that's where that first 20, or that first, I would say the 20 days of um, literacy comes in handy. If you've not looked that up, it's free online. Um, there's a lot of anchor church where you do some basic literacy things at the beginning of every year and you set the tone for what your literacy time is going to look like. So one of the things that I struggled with when I first started teaching was getting to all the language strands. And I came up with these bell ringers as a way to get to every strand every week. And this is a really easy way for my students and myself to cover a lot of the language concepts. Now, what I will say is please don't mark everything. Oh my goodness, you will be doing this forever. Mark random Mondays. Don't tell them which ones. I tell them that I assess everything, but I don't necessarily mark everything. So they know that I will be looking at everything they do, and if it's not done well, I will make them do it again. But I will not necessarily put a mark on everything. I might put a mark on the Friday one week and I might put a mark on the Tuesday the next week. Whatever I think that I want to mark in my mark book for. Um, and so I might write down root words uh, and then the date. So July 14th, for example. 
And that gives me a sense of what, how they did on that. Did they get it? Did they not get it? Do we need to work more on it? Um, do I need a little mini lesson on it at some point? And I do mini lessons when I'm doing my guided reading. So when I'm pulling students to do those articles, I'm also doing a little mini lesson if that group needed it. So if I looked at their beltwork duotangs and they needed root word lessons, then we're going to do a little mini one on whiteboards after we're done reading that article. Um, and this gives me a really good sense of where things are at with all of my students and it's nice to see. And it's also nice to be able to leave in a bin and then I can mark it as I feel like marking it. And I, again, I am not marking every day, every week. That would be insane. You will never stop marking. Just my own tip. Uh, my nonfiction articles. So I really try to tie my nonfiction articles into my science and social studies because let's be honest, there is not enough time to teach everything. And those content subjects need a background of knowledge before you can go and do some of the fun experiments or activities. Um, I love to build a rover with students, but they have to know the terrain of the planet that we were on and they have to know how difficult it is to get supplies to space. So it's nice to have that background knowledge first. So I really try to tie that into my language so that I'm using my time wisely and I can really have some fun with them in science. So this is some of the things um, that I've done. So we do Canada's Miraculous Canada. I had a six, seven this year. So space is one of our topics. Um, when I had five, we did some human body ones and they were really cool. Um, so it's nice to be able to reread. And I have a link down here, the power of rereading, uh, because there is some really good research. I don't know why I put it here, apologies. But there's some really good research to support that rereading articles and fiction more than one time really benefit students because they get a lot out of it. Um, so these are an, an example of one of the activities that goes with my um, article. So this is day three, so obviously Wednesday, and they have to make different connections to different parts of the article. This is the digital version. The, the paper version comes with black and white, just so you know. Um, digital, I just like to make it fun colors. So this is something that I really give to them because then they have to go back to the article, as I've said. Uh, so centers, what can go wrong? So you can see students searching for a book. You can see behaviors. You can see craziness during centers, marking too much, or students off topic. Let me address the first one and then the next slide I'll address the rest of them. Uh, searching for a book. I do not allow students to search for a book during language time. I just don't. You can search for a book at recess. You can search for a book at lunchtime if you're finished. You can search for a book at the beginning of the day when you walk in. I always have math at the beginning of the day because I like how focused they are or whenever you want to make that time. Um, but I like it at the beginning of the day because I'm getting attendance done. I do not have time to police them. So if they're going to search for a book, it gives them a focus and gets them doing something purposeful. So that's your time. If you don't do it during that time, then I have to talk to you at recess and we have to discuss how you're going to choose a book now at recess. And I find I only have to do that once and then I never have to do that again because I don't want to stand. So it's nice to be able to give that because then that, that doesn't allow for that. So when somebody's up searching for a book during language time, I automatically get that one student always that says, so-and-so searching for a book. They're not supposed to be, which makes my life easier because I know that I need to address that with them. Um, and I only have to do it a couple times and then it's done. So as far as the other concerns, um, the craziness during centers, I will say, when you're starting in September, if you're a new teacher, you do not start with full language lessons, or at least I've never been able to. I start with short periods of time. I build an accountability with rewards or systems like an economy program. So in my room, for example, um, they have to pay every month to be able to use a desk and be in the classroom. And then I pay them for being a student. And if they do any extra jobs, I pay them for those jobs. I will never go away from an economy program. I think it's the best thing ever um, because we also talk about taxes. They have to pay taxes in April. Um, it uh, builds in classroom jobs because I like a neat room and I want it to stay that way. So I have custodians and they get on the kids when it's messy now because they know that they're going to have to clean it up or the kid they're going to make the kids clean it up and I'm okay with that. Um, in September, you have to stop when things get in focus, in my experience. So that means you're not going to get through much content in language, and that's okay. But it's easier to build in that discipline now than to try to get it back in December. Um, there's an expression that you don't smile to Christmas, and that's not entirely accurate. But the idea that 
you have to be strict now so that in December and January you can relax is very true. You have to follow the, oh, everyone's done silent reading? Okay, put your books away. Let's do something. And you have to be consistent about it and have a few of those extra literacy activities. And that's where that um, first 20 days of literacy comes from. If you Google it, you'll find it online free. You want to use those activities so that, oh, you're done your silent reading? Fine. Then we're moving on now. And we're going to have a mini lesson on writing. Um, and so that you have something in your back pocket that you can pull out if they get unfocused. And you don't have to do that long and you celebrate. Oh, you know what? We were able to silent read for five extra minutes today. Kudos, guys. That's awesome. Um, and give them a reward, whatever your reward is. I have uh, teachers that love Dojo. If you're using Dojo, they just get points. They never take them away, so it's never a negative thing. Um, you don't have to connect parents if you don't want to. It's just points. And they can use those points like currency to get something. Maybe they get a candy. Maybe they get extra gym time. In September, I reward heavily. And I can't say this enough. Even if you're a teacher that thinks you don't have to bribe students, don't think of it that way. Think of it as building the independence of them and building accountability. So um, Kayla came in and she sat down and got out her book without me being asked. Kayla, you get five dojo points. Kudos, that's awesome. And I say it loudly. And then I might give points to those that follow suit. They might not. And they know that they may or may not get points. So if they're the first one to do it, they definitely will get points if I see them doing that. Um, and I reward as soon as I see it. Good job, uh, Jackson. You have sat down and you have got out your work and I didn't have to say a thing to you. That's awesome. I also try to, and this is just separate, but I also try to also, I also try to also, I also try to um, message parents if I use a messaging system or an email. Hey, I love how your daughter came in. She sat down and she didn't need my instructions. She just did what she was supposed to do. That's awesome. Um, and then that also has the parents encouraging the child. Um, I try to put a responsible person in each group if I'm doing centers because then they're at least going to either tattle on that, the other students or they're going to tell them what to do. Whether they're responsible or not is irrelevant, although that's a wonderful bonus, although it doesn't seem to happen in my room. But they would, they love to do that because they like to tattle. And even though I don't encourage the tattling, having them telling others what to do is okay with me. Uh, these are some great sites to try. I'm not going to stay long on here and go over much of this. Uh, but these are some great ones. You can see dollar signs beside the ones that cost money. Um, they're excellent. Free rice is hilarious because they can earn um, rice that is given away to countries that need uh, food donations. Um, and they get really competitive. We had a free rice crown this year. Uh, by the way, it was a old piece of cardboard that I put into a circle and stapled. And that was the crown. And you would not believe how my grade sevens fought over the crown. Uh, if you're in primary, let me move this. If you're in primary, you're probably going to be focusing on totally different things. You're going to be focusing on things like decoding, chunking, digraphs, predicting, making connections. And there are some tie-ins to junior intermediate, but not as many things that are the same. In junior intermediate, you're going to focus on searching and finding information, predicting, making connections, but synthesizing, analyzing, inferring, genre, summarizing. Those are all things that come with junior intermediate. As I've said before, it's really hard for me to fit in all my content. So I really do try to fit in content subjects within my language by like watching a video and having a discussion. Reading articles with the, with the social studies, history, geography, or science focus. Um, ReadWorks is great, although I have my own on TPT. So if you're looking for some, mine tie into the grade content often of that subject, or at least what I feel is the interest of that subject or that grade level. Uh, creating a podcast is great. Using Canva or things like Canva to create um, Instagram posts or Facebook posts, although they don't generally use Facebook, but TikTok videos. Um, they can do lots of cool things like that. This year we did um, I Want to Go Home, I love that book, and they created a series of five Instagram posts which were awesome on um, different characters' perspectives. They were terrific. How can you make your planning easier and have more time for yourself? So one of them is color coding by grade. So I color code by grade and I color code by subjects. So for example, you can see right here this year I had a six. I have my math in blue and my language in pink. When I have two grades, I use four colors. 
So I have my math in blue for my five or my sixes. And then for my sevens, for example, this year, I had a light green. And then for my language, I had pink and I had, I think, uh, a different shade of pink so that when I put them in my file tabs, I could see them. Although I will say that you can often get away with, um, if you're using my bell ringers, you can often get away with just one language bell ringer and that's okay. Um, it's not too much more difficult to reach up to the next level um, because the language content is so similar. The math, you really do need each grade specifically. So I stay on top of things by having a filing tab that I organize like this. I did this one summer um, and it was a life changer for me because I really could find things and I got all my weeks labeled ahead and then I photocopied 10 weeks of each, my language and my math, and I plopped them in a folder. And that way there's always one ready to go. Um, I also keep a spiral sheet in a binder at the back of my, or uh, at the back of the tub. See, there's um, empty sections here and I keep my, blank copies that are on colored paper back there and then I can grab four or five weeks and then if I'm away I give those to a sub with the colored paper and say please make this many copies of this sheet um, and then that way when I come back I have another four weeks and I can kind of extend doing that um, because we often have those learning opportunities where we're forced to be away and it's often on my 60 minute prep so that way I use my time wisely and I can get my sub to use the time wisely. Going into read alouds, I'm not going to spend a long time in this video on them, uh, but there, I do think that you really need to consider some specific types of authors. So for example, for three and four, Roald Dahl is excellent. Fenway and Hattie is terrific and classics like Charlotte's Web and The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane or Wrinkle in Time, all great books for this age group. Grade four has very similar context. So bring Bridge to Terabithia, One and Only Ivan. So I've listed different ones, but you can kind of reach up by one grade, but I would say you want to stay within those ranges. Again, Roll Dole for grade four. Lightning Thief, because it covers Greek myths. And if you're doing the social studies for grade four, that covers a lot of content for you. So it's a nice double dip. You get to use your, your time wisely here. Grade five, you'll see Wonder again. Holes I love. And I start diving into a little bit of science fiction with City of Ember, because they start getting interested in that. Um, I also talk about uh, world issues with Number of the Stars. Uh, and then usually to set my tone in a year, I would start with something like The Bully Book or um, Mr. Turrup because they really set the tone for the classroom in what the class community should be like. Grade six, again, I dive a little bit more fully into science fiction. I like things like, um, uh, sorry, I'm looking quickly through, Among the Hidden um, and... Um, the Collectors is good for social justice issues. And I really get into that in grade six. I like a, one, uh, sorry, a Long Walk to Water and Iqbal. Uh, Side of the Beaver is also good. Uh, for fantasy, um, really getting into things like Unwanted. Um, but my ultimate favorite for grade six, actually two favorites because I love books, uh, Space Case because it covers your space terminology. You do not have to teach a whole bunch of space if you read this prior to doing your space unit. Just a hot tip for you, uh, because that book is just fantastic. And then Colossus Rises. And I only ever read the first one in a series, and I do that because I want them to pick up a book and read. Um, so I make them convince me that they should get my next copy instead of somebody else. So Colossus Rises is excellent if they've read Lightning Thief in previous grades and they loved it, or a teacher read it to them, because... It's very similar, but even in a more grown up way, the characters are a little bit older. They're dealing with a little bit more older issues and they're going, they're thicker books. They're going to want to read them. They're excellent. Uh, my daughter flew through them in the summer. She was done in a few weeks and begging for more books, but there were no more. Okay, um, grade seven and eight, they're very similar. You could read the same content in seven and an eight. So you'll see that I have different books listed, but you definitely could reach up or reach down, whichever you prefer. Anything by Eric Walters is great at this age or uh, Alan Gratz, uh, Gordon Corman. Um, Red Wolf and Touching Spirit Bear are ones that have been controversial, but they do have good content in them as far as social justice. But really be cautious and read first because it might not be your cup of tea. I've heard they're good, but be cautious. Uh, Victoria Aveyard and uh, Pretty's Uglies, both of those authors, excellent for strong female leads. Um, and then Giver getting into some, the Giver, sorry, getting into some real science fiction, but a sad ending. So be cautious. Night Divided, a great social justice issue if you're talking about the Berlin Wall. Um, and it really 
highlights some of the things that have gone on in the past and maybe some of the things that are going on now. Grade eight, um, again, uh, I only had grade eight and I tended to read the grade seven books because mine were weak, but these are the ones that I've read that I love, um, but I've not read them aloud to a class, although I know other teachers have and they're excellent. Uh, they are ones that I have personally read and loved. Hatchet, I love, and I actually read that to my grade seven class, but some of these I have not read, but I like to a class, but I, I have read them. Uh, back to school picture books. So if you're starting the year, these are all great books that you could start your year. There are some that are maybe a little younger. Um, if you're wanting kids to write a tall tale on how they spent their summer vacation, I often have them do that. And it, it's fun because they can really go out of control on them. Um, then this is a really great one to start with for a writing piece. Um, I keep a binder that's called, I didn't do my homework, Mrs. Spratling, because, so I often read this one to them. And then, um, if you want to teach them resiliency and, and that mistakes are okay, this is a good one. But if you're really just starting on class, uh, feel and, um, their overall community, you want to start with something like, thank you, Mr. Falker. It's a great book. You'll cry. We've already covered that. How do you get started? Um, so for starting the year, you're going to get your bell ringers copied and ready to go in a tub, get out any no notebooks or workbooks you're going to need to give to students. I prefer these spiral notebooks because they have the pocket folders and then kids who have no organizational skills can stuff things in and then we do a weekly clean out. I hate binders personally. I know that's a personal thing um, because I can have them hand these in in tubs and then I can mark them whenever I want. The other option, and I use, I alternate in different years. Um, these are nice and light. So you go through them really quickly. They won't last as long, but you'll be done them in, in a few months. So you won't need them to last. So you, you would, I would either use these or these. The nice benefit with these is the pocket folders because a lot of students have no organizational skills and at least that gives them some place to put things. Um, for math, I do the same thing, just for the record, although this is for language. Um, and I also get ready my San Diego word list and I copy it and put it up somewhere that I'm not gonna lose it. Um, I like to keep my desk clean, but it, that does go on a pile on my desk. It, generally, my desk is fairly empty, but that is, is always on my desk. Um, I always, let me just move this. I always get supplies for get to know you games ready. I get a notebook out for my super saver program. That's the class management program where I pay them and they do jobs. I get anchor charts ready at a time with sentence starters. Like I feel blank about reading and I follow the first 20 days of literacy. I mean, you can follow whatever expensive program you want, but this is an excellent program and it's free. So to me, this is a no brainer. I can follow this and then dive into my own program after that. Uh, I figure out how I will communicate with parents. I like Dojo, uh, although in seven and eight, I often use just my email. Uh, it discourages the constant messaging at night. Uh, I figure out how I'm gonna have them turn in work. I have a bucket they place their books in, and I did this even in grade eight because it's easier for me to collect a bucket and take it home than it is for me to ask for every one of them to hand in a page. Um, and I figure out where they're gonna store their work. During non-COVID times, I'm uh, again, I have a bucket. The nice thing with these, um, and I'll say it again, is that they are attached to the book. So if you do a binder to me, um, and I have them do it on a piece of paper, they can tell me that they lost that paper. It's hard for them to tell me that they lost that paper without having it ripped out of the book. So that's that's nice to, to find things. It also goes sequentially so I can see the progress. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you also need to designate what jobs are priorities for you. So for me, uh, storing and putting away tech was a big priority. Sorry, excuse me. And then also cleaning up the classroom is a huge priority for me. So I always have a job that relates around those two things. And then other jobs come as I see the class and what they need. Um, I set up a, a binder or a sub tub. I like a binder personally because it's easy for them to take right off the shelf and it's really quickly organized. Um, I highly suggest you, you photocopy several extra pages of review. This is where I do photocopy. I use those Costco books and I get all the review done and photocopied so that I have at least, um, and I say two pages there, I, I would say I probably actually in reality have four of math, four of language, and then several other random pages so that if I'm sick or there's a family emergency, somebody else can jump in and all they have to do is follow the schedule and pick a page. Because if you're truly sick or you can't be there, do you honestly care what they do? 
or does it really just matter that they were alive at the end of the day and they the sub got through the day? And to me, that is the most important. I've subbed um, a lot at the beginning of my career. I took a whole year to sub and then travel. Um, and because of that, I know how hard it is to be a sub. And if you're just a new teacher, you know how hard it is possibly. And so if that's the case, you want to make it easy on the person stepping in. I um, mean, our board, we have so few subs right now that often that means that somebody from the board office is stepping in. So it's a lot easier if you just leave something that's quick and easy and they don't have to think about it. and anybody can do it. Um, I always leave um, math games and I have uh, decks of cards in my room in little containers and I have a student that's in charge of making sure that those decks stay together and are collected and all the cards are there. That's their job. And you put the pickiest kid on that one. Um, and so I teach them some easy math games at the very beginning of the year. And that's a great way to teach turn taking to see who can work together. But it also gives me something that I can put in my supply kit. The students all know how to play this, this, and this, and then see this student if you don't know how to play, because there's always a student that you know that you can leave that for. Um, and if not, you can always leave a link to a video. There's always a video on YouTube. Um, so I leave that and then I always leave an adult coloring page because I don't know what it is. My students go into a hypnotic trance when there's an exotic adult coloring page. It's amazing how well they do, even though their art pieces are not as beautiful, I have to say some of them, but their coloring pages are stunning. So I leave that because they sit and they color quietly and they put on music. So that is like my last wow, here you go, here's a fun end of the day. And then also I put go outside if it's nice out. Um, for starting the year, I get a back to school letter ready to send home to parents. And I also, in my first line put, I this is the only newsletter I'm going to send home all year because I don't like sending newsletters for the newsletter's sake. Parents can follow along with their students if they're in junior intermediate and they can figure out what they're learning. If they want my long range plans, I, I happily give them to parents. Here's an outline, it's a very broad outline. Um, with the idea that this could change depending on student needs. So these are my social media platforms. I'm also on TPT, as I mentioned before. So if you want to find me, you're welcome to message me on my Facebook platform. That's really easy to message. I'm on Instagram. I'm at Mrs. S Room and Mrs. S Room.com. I have a few products up there, but none of my digital products. So if you're looking for digital products or even just products with digital lessons, you'll want to look on TPT. Um, I can't sell for less um, than I'm selling on TPT on my site. Uh, that's a TPT rule. If somebody else is doing that, they're not following rules and that's okay, but I can't. I, don't, I can't risk losing my TPT. So if you are interested in any of my products or you just want more messages um, on how you run your language program or a question about how I run this, please feel free to reach out. I am very happy to answer questions and it's always nice to hear from other people. And if you use one of my programs, um, feel free to reach out as well and tell me how it went. Um, I am adding to my full year program. So if you have one of my full year programs, I am adding fiction resources as well as a week's worth of activities for them. In addition to little reading and writing mini lessons. So if you're coming into this, you're going to have all of that with it. It just may not be available the first week of school because I'll still be working on it. Uh, thank you so much. If you're watching my video, please check me out on TPT and on Facebook. Thank you.